Hello and welcome. It's 10am on Wednesday, the 4th of February. You're tuned in to our mid-morning newscast here on Adirang TV. It's great that you could join us. I'm Mark Broom. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. Islamic State releases a video appearing to show a captured Jordanian pilot being burned alive. Jordan vows an earth-shaking response. The defense chiefs of South Korea and China will meet in Seoul today for talks on the North Korean nuclear threat and the current security situation on the Korean peninsula. Plus, Korea's foreign exchange reserves drop in January from a month earlier as the value of the euro and the British pound weakened. We start with the latest and most horrific act of murder yet by the extremist group that calls itself Islamic State. In a slickly produced video released online on Tuesday, IS militants burn a caged Jordanian pilot to death. We will not be showing any part of the graphic video or the images which triggered a wave of condemnation from world leaders, including the King of Jordan, who has vowed revenge. Connie Lee reports. Jordan has vowed punishment and revenge against Islamic State militants for the horrifically brutal death of pilot Muhad al Qasasbe. Jordan's King Abdullah, who briefly met with President Barack Obama at the White House Tuesday night, cut his U.S. trip short after hearing news of the murder. In a statement, King Abdullah hailed the pilot as a hero and called the terrorists cowardly. We meet today with the great grief, despair, and anger following the death as a martyr of the heroic pilot Muaf al Qasasbe by the hands of the coward terrorists that behaved in an extremely wrong, criminal and prejudicial manner that has nothing to do with Islam. According to security officials in Jordan, some IS-linked militants jailed there will be executed in response. This comes after the Islamic State released the extremely graphic video on Tuesday, which purportedly shows the hostage being burned alive inside a cage. As the authenticity of the video is being confirmed, President Obama called the militant group vicious and barbaric. Whatever ideology they're operating off of, uh, it's bankrupt. And this organization appears only interested in uh, death and destruction. In Jordan, citizens rallied in Karak, the hometown of the pilot, on Tuesday night to express their anger. Many are calling for the swift execution of militants jailed in Jordan, including Sajda al-Rashawi, the Iraqi woman on death row who was offered up as a prisoner swap for the pilot. 26-year-old al Qasasbe was captured in December when his jet crashed in Syria during a bombing mission against IS. He leaves behind a wife, parents, and a nation brimming with grief and fury. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Now, in the rest of the day's news, and Chinese Defense Minister Chang Wan Chuan is in Seoul for a three day visit to hold talks with his South Korean counterpart, Han Mingu. The talks will begin on this Wednesday afternoon. Topping the agenda will be military and nuclear threats from Pyongyang and the current security situation on the Korean Peninsula. They will also discuss ways to further boost bilateral cooperation, including the establishment of a direct military hotline. Now, Chang is the third Chinese defense minister to visit South Korea. The last visit by a Chinese defense minister to Seoul was all the way back in 2006. The top nuclear envoys from South Korea and China will meet in Beijing today for talks on efforts to denuclearize North Korea. Seoul's foreign ministry says Huang Jungkook and his Chinese counterpart Wu Dawei will not only discuss ways to prevent North Korea from further developing its nuclear weapons program, but also talk about the possibility of reviving the stalled six-party denuclearization talks last held in 2008. The two envoys are resuming talks where they left off, really, uh, during the last round of talks last October. The meeting today follows trilateral talks in Tokyo last week among nuclear envoys from South Korea, the US and Japan on bringing North Korea back to those six-party talks. 
Now, stung by slumping approval ratings, President Park Geun-hye has announced plans to establish smoother coordination between the top office and her cabinet. The president hopes the move will reassure the public that she is listening to their concerns. Our chase on reports. Amid a public backlash over the government's tax policy revisions and its suspension of reforms to the National Health Insurance Program, President Park Geun-hye called for greater coordination between the cabinet and her office. 새로 신설이 되는 정책 조정 협의회를 통해서 청와대와 내각 간의 사전 협의와 조율도 강화해 나가기를 바랍니다. She emphasized that officials must clearly understand how a policy will affect the lives of the public through simulations and data analyses. Otherwise, she said its purpose will eventually be defeated. The president did not, however, respond to bipartisan calls for administration to decide between increasing taxes to add welfare benefits or scaling down on welfare to avoid raising taxes. Earlier on Tuesday, ruling party leader Kim Musang had heavily criticized President Park's election pledge to increase welfare without a tax hike. A recent poll showed 65 percent of Korean people thought it would be impossible to expand welfare without raising taxes. I agree with them, and it would be wrong for a politician to deceive the public by promising more welfare without raising taxes. Instead, Kim said the priority should be to review where the welfare budget is being spent and to seek ways to reduce expenses before opting to raise taxes. As for the government's backtracking on health insurance reforms, Kim vowed to initiate better communication between the party, government and presidential office. Choi Yoo-sun, Arirang News. Now, President Park's comments came shortly after the newly elected floor leader of the ruling Senuri Party also called for changes to regain the public's trust. He says the president and the party are facing a crisis, but this time could actually serve as an opportunity for both the president and the party to make some major improvements. So, Ijeon reports. For the ruling party's new floor leader, Yu Sung Min, his win wasn't about an anti President Park Geun-hye camp defeating a pro Bok faction. For him, it signaled a chance for the ruling camp to reform and rebound ahead of next year's general elections. With President Bok's approval ratings at their lowest level since she took office, Yu is calling for policy changes to win back the hearts of a disappointed public. Pointing to criticism of the president's personnel picks, you told reporters that President Bach must carry out a drastic shakeup of her people. As for policymaking, he believes the party should take a stance vis-a-vis -vis the presidential office. To do that, he says the party should no longer just support whatever the presidential office lays out in front of them. Instead, the party should play a leading role in setting the agenda for the nation. You, however, did promise to improve communications and cooperation with the government to iron out differences before putting major policies into motion. In response to the government's push to increase taxes to cover welfare benefits, he said it's either higher taxes with more benefits or lower taxes with less welfare, not more welfare without a tax hike. Political analysts say the new floor leader's eagerness for change could turn the page for the ruling camp. But it remains to be seen whether the presidential office will lend an ear to his criticisms and demands. Lee Jun, Arirang News. Korea's military court has sentenced a 23-year-old soldier to death for a shooting rampage last June that killed five soldiers. Delivering its ruling on Tuesday, the court acknowledged the soldier, identified only by his family name In. He was young and uh, has no previous criminal record and had a pretty hard time in school. However, the court also stressed that Im had showed zero remorse and continued to blame others for what he did last June. The military court said it was compelled to sentence him to death due to the gruesome nature of his crime. The defendant is expected to appeal. Now, in the rest of the day's international news, the newly elected Prime Minister of Greece was in Italy on Tuesday as part of his government's campaign to ensure a rattled Europe that Athens 
does intend to pay its debts. For a closer look at this story, we connect live to Eunice Kim at the News Centre. So, Eunice, this new anti-austerity government has been greeted with a degree of scepticism across Europe, but uh, it seems like Greece's 40-year-old Prime Minister uh, has been working his uh, Greek charm on his Italian counterpart. Yeah, and perhaps it is that Italian Prime Minister Matteo Renzi is himself a young leader, also 40 years old, and his politics center left. But following uh, the two prime ministers' meetings, they did hold a press conference in which Mr. Renzi said he strongly believes conditions exist for Greece and European institutions to find common ground. I'm convinced that we need to read in the result of the Greek elections the message of hope that comes from a whole generation of people who ask that they have more attention, more care and more interest on who is suffering the crisis. Up until now it is the poor who have paid the price of the economic crisis and certainly not the rich. In Greece we have had a corrupt state which we want to change. This is our first task for the Greek people and for our European partners. Mr. Cyprus, you saw there, you may have noticed that he famously chooses not to wear a tie. And in a statement that his government is here to work, so Mr. Renzi then gifted him a tie, which the Greek leader accepted, saying he would wear it on the day that Greece is able to move past its debt crisis and faltering economy mark. Well, let's hope he gets to put his tie on uh, sooner rather than later. And uh, Greece has actually ditched its initial demands for a debt write-off in favour of swapping its debt now for new uh, growth-linked bonds. Any more progress on that front? Sure. Well, Greece's finance minister has been on a campaign to touch base with Europe's key players and ensure skeptics that exiting Christ the crisis, well, is possible. Now, following a meeting with his Italian counterpart, uh, uh, Minister Yanis Varoufakis said he could see an end to Greece's financial crisis by June and also asked for a bridge agreement that would give Athens time to work out a roadmap to eventually pay off its 240 billion euro bailout that is about 272 billion US dollars the finance minister continues his campaign with a meeting with ECB's president uh, Mario Draghi in Frankfurt on Thursday before sitting down with his German counterpart in Berlin okay staying in Europe and uh, let's take a look at a developing story that's coming out of the UK and the British Parliament is on course to green light a controversial fertility procedure that would actually allow doctors to create babies using DNA from three separate individuals fill us in on the details right so the treatment is called a three parent in vitro fertilization and it is intended to help stop incurable mitochondrial diseases which can include brain damage and heart failure from being passed on to the baby it would involve dna from a female donor the third parent if you will because defective mitochondria is only passed on from the mother now the uk became the first to move forward on okaying this controversial process. Lawmakers passed a bill at the House of Commons Tuesday after some 90 minutes of heated debate, and it does still face another vote at the House of Lords. Now, ahead of that vote, Health Minister Jane Ellison called it a bold but a considered and informed step. But critics say it crosses a fundamental ethical boundary, and though the DNA used in this process would not affect things like hair color or personality traits that it certainly uh, would be a step closer to creating designer babies. Okay, Eunice, thank you very much for your reports and we'll see you back at noon. See you then. Korea's foreign exchange reserves dropped to their lowest level in eight months. In January, the Bank of Korea says the reserves stood at around 362 billion US dollars as of the end of last month, down almost one and a half billion dollars. The central bank attributes the fall to the weakening euro and British pound against the greenback. 
As of the end of December last year, Korea actually had the seventh largest foreign reserves in the world, following countries such as China, Japan and Switzerland. Now, Koreans in their 20s and 30s are being warned to think very seriously about their retirement plans because a new report shows that, as it stands right now, nearly half of them will have to work past the official retirement age of 65. And if the current job opportunities for senior citizens are any indication, the work will be part-time, low-paid and irregular. Our Hwang Jie has the details. When 30-year-old Koreans become 65, the country's employment rate for the elderly is expected to top 40 percent, with more than 7.3 million people their age or older participating in economic activities. Now that points to a need for quality jobs for the elderly who are living in a country that has one of the most rapidly aging populations in the world. A recent report by the Korea Institute for Health and Social Affairs says that the rise in the elderly employment rate comes as life expectancy increases while most of them are unprepared for life after retirement. Korea's life expectancy stood at around 77 years in 2002, but it's expected to rise to 82 and a half years in 2020. The country's elderly poverty rate, however, was close to 50 percent in 2010, the highest among OECD member states. The rate is also around four times higher than the OECD average of 12.4 percent. The report adds that more than nine out of ten Korean workers ages 65 or older had either temporary or part-time jobs in 2012. With more of the elderly expected to look for jobs in the future, it appears critical for policymakers to find a way to improve the job market for them. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. And a new report shows more Koreans are choosing to put off tying the knot. The total number of marriages in Korea could potentially hit an all-time low for last year once all the data is in. Statistics Korea says that between January and November, 271,000 marriages were recorded. That's 30,000 under the amount recorded in 2003. That was the year that saw the lowest number of marriages since related data was collected. The agency also forecasts the number of newborns to drop to below 420,000 this year. That's a low not seen since the 1960s. Now, Korea's passion for education is known around the world, but it does come at a hefty financial price. The average Korean household spends nearly 7% of its income on learning various subjects. However, the current economic conditions here in Korea are holding parents back. Uh, from spending too much money, especially when it comes to uh, potentially sending their kids overseas for their schooling. Our Kim Jong has a story. Their chimes at midnight, but high school students in Korea are often still packed with students studying their textbooks. Some shell out big money to follow a separate curriculum offered by private academies in addition to their class materials. It shows just how much Koreans prioritize education, as attending a good university has a tremendous impact on a person's career. However, in recent months, the bad economy has started to have an effect on how much Koreans spend on education. In fact, the Bank of Korea and the Education Ministry say private academy expenses tumbled to a three-year low last year. During the January to November period, money spent on private education academies dropped 0.8 percent from the same period last year to 7.3 billion U.S. dollars. The number of students studying overseas also dropped from 262,000 in 2011 to less than 220,000 last year. Overseas education spending plunged 14 percent last year, compared to the previous year amounting to $372 million, a nine-year low. An official from the Education Ministry says students are heading to English-speaking countries with lower living expenses. The number of Korean students studying in Western countries has waned. In particular, those in Britain have dropped by nearly 60 percent. In stark contrast, Korean students studying in the Philippines jumped 52 percent to more than 7,000 last year. Kim Jong, Arirang News.
And a good Wednesday morning to you all as we kick things off with the Korean national football team, where after months of no rest and just trying to prepare for the 2015 Asian Cup, head coach Uli Stilke is finally set to get his well-deserved rest. Now, the 61-year-old who was named the national team head coach last September will leave to Spain next week and will rest for three weeks before returning to Korea in time for the start of the 2015 K-League season. And from there on, his busy schedule continues on as he's set to focus on the domestic talents once again before a set of A matches in March, followed by the second stage of the World Cup qualification matches in June. And as head coach Silke stated, the end of the Asian Cup is just the start of things to come. Now there's the age-old question, would you rather be a big fish in a pond or a small fish in the ocean, right? Well, for Korea's Lee Chung-yong, when the ocean is the English Premier League, you would rather be a small fish in the ocean. Now the South Korean international who was in the England's second-tier championship league with the Bolton Wanderers will return to the English Premier League as Crystal Palace purchased his contract just before the end of the January transfer window. Now a win-win situation for both teams as Bolton sells the striker before his contract expires and Crystal Palace, who is currently in 13th place, gets the much-needed offense. Now MLB.com had Pittsburgh Pirates Kang Jong-ho as the fourth biggest steal of this offseason after investing just $16 million on the former Nexon hero. Well, a steal is only as good as the number he's going to put up, right? Well, according to MLB.com, he's projected to hit 266 with 12 home runs while driving in 45 RBIs and even stealing five bases. And while many don't expect him to start off the new season as a starter, he's still ranked higher than Jordy Mercer in the 2015 shortstop ranking. Now, expectations remain high for Kang Jong-ho as he continues his training with the Nexon Heroes in Arizona. Now, the Lotte Giants in the KBO have some of the greatest fans in the league, but those fans aren't too happy with the way that the team is run, which is why those fans are hoping to purchase the Lotte Giants. Now, a movement has started in order to make the Giants into a citizens team, meaning a team owned by the public and those who purchased a share of the team. And their goal is to gather 300,000 fans to invest 300,001 or roughly 270 U.S. dollars each and gather a total of 90 billion won or roughly 81.8 million U.S. dollars. Now the only problem is the Lotte Giants aren't willing to sell the team and have instead taken this recent movement as a wake-up call to improve the team operations. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning. Uh, today is the beginning of the spring according to the East Asian calendar, but instead of gentle spring breeze blowing in, we'll have fine dust coming in. Uh, though right now the level of fine dust is at a normal level, but as the day goes on, except regions in the east, the rest will have a moderately high level of fine dust. And the skies will be covered with lots of clouds throughout the day, which makes it feel chillier than actual temperatures but readings will still be higher than seasonal norms as the daily high here in Seoul will peak at 4, while the top temperatures in Daegu will rise to 8 and Gwangju and Busan both peak at 6 this afternoon. And as for the other regions, Jeju Island will see a high of 6 and Jeju and Tokdo will top out at 5 and 3 respectively. Now this week should wrap up under mild conditions, but starting Sunday, uh, things will get quite cold again again with lows plummeting to minus 8 here in Seoul on next Monday. That's all for Korea and here's international weather for beers around the world.
Well, that's all we have for now. Plenty more stories worth checking out online. And we'll be back at noon Korea time with our next newscast. Until then, goodbye.